When the Japanese government formally surrendered in 1945, the new military governor of the Japanese islands, Douglas MacArthur, was in a peculiar position of both power and responsibility. As the supreme commander for the Allied powers, he was the highest authority in fields of civil and military matters on the Japanese home islands. The politically ambitious MacArthur could create a completely new Japanese political system from the ground up, leaving out nationalists and militarists to create a liberal, US-aligned country which could act as an important ally to stave off the array of communist revolutions in the Far East. Today, however, there is an undeniable remnant of nationalism in the highest level of government positions. Top politicians in Japan often cause controversy at home and abroad by referencing revisionist remarks about Japan's role in World War II. What was it that MacArthur did, or did not do, that led to nationalism being sustained in Japanese politics until today? In this video, we're going to take a look at how MacArthur's domestic policies shaped contemporary Japanese politics. In early August 1945, the Pacific War was coming to an end. Allies to the West surrendered earlier in 1945, and now Japan stands as the sole foe against the Soviet Union, the United States, and Britain. Anyone in the military and government knew Japan would have to sue for peace. However, there was disagreement around the exact terms of such a peace treaty. The Potsdam Declaration, issued on July 26th, called for an unconditional surrender of the Japanese government and military. Prime Minister Suzuki Kantaro rejected the offer after much deliberation and instead chose to meet the planned Allied invasion on the home islands, hoping to score a decisive victory in order to force the Allies to offer more agreeable terms. On August 6th, the first atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima, killing between 70 and 140,000 people. On August 9th, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, and the Soviet Union broke neutrality and invaded Manchuria, gaining territory rapidly. Even after all of this, the Supreme War Council was deadlocked on the Potsdam Declaration. On August 15th, the emperor himself proclaimed an imperial decision to break the deadlock and accept the Potsdam Declaration. In a radio broadcast, he commanded his subjects to surrender. World War II was finally over. How the Japanese civilian population and remnants of armed forces would face the first arriving Allied occupying forces heading towards Tokyo was still uncertain at this point. The initial policies of the occupying force, referred to as GHQ in Japan, sought to democratize and liberalize Japanese society without creating too much discontent among the civilian population. For the first time, women were allowed to vote in the general election of 1946. Previously outlawed parties like communist and socialist parties were quickly re-established and gained popularity. Sweeping antitrust measures against the giant industrial conglomerates called Zaibatsu were conducted with the aim of ultimately breaking up hundreds of Zaibatsu by the end of the occupation. In an event known as the Purge, thousands of former government officials involved with war crimes, colonization, ultranationalist or imperialist associations, and Zaibatsu industrialists who supported the Japanese arms industry were removed from any position of power in the government, private sector, and higher education. Among those democratization measures, the most compelling and far-reaching action was Article 9 of the newly formed constitution, which includes a vow to never maintain armed forces or use war as a diplomatic tool. MacArthur wanted to turn the occupation into a success story of American democracy defeating Japanese ultranationalism, not only militarily, but now also in the minds of the people. He was careful in choosing the intensity of each and every measure to ensure that in the aggregate they were still tolerable for the Japanese general populace. To that end, 
MacArthur deliberately chose to exclude the emperor from any war crime prosecution, going as far as to coordinate efforts with the imperial household and even indicted class A war criminals to make sure that no testimony given compromises the emperor in any way. While Japan slowly recovered in the years until 1950, the geopolitical landscape in East Asia and the rest of the world changed rapidly. The main adversary of Western democracies has changed from fascism to communism. Accordingly, the relationship between the Allies and the Soviet Union deteriorated dramatically. Communism began to spread worldwide and after the Chinese Civil War ended in a communist victory, the US government began to worry about Japan. Socialist parties were gaining popularity ever since the end of the war, with the Japanese Socialist Party winning the general election in 1947. The US government at this point feared the possibility of a communist revolution, or at the very least a socialist government which may want to join the non-aligned movement instead of being under the umbrella of the US. Due to this fear, the GHQ enacted policies known as the reverse course. Initially adopted policies which were perceived to strengthen socialist or communist thinking were stopped or reversed entirely. Antitrust measures seen as too close to socialist thinking were largely abandoned and Japan was even pressured by the US to form a standing army again which was prohibited by the new constitution which was written under the eyes of US officials not even a decade ago. The most significant measure, however, was the cease of the purge of war criminals and the establishment of a red purge against high-ranking individuals in public and private sector suspected of being members of communist or left-wing organizations. Previously purged prominent ultranationalist figures and even war criminals returned to public life while socialists and communists began to fade. The thinned out ranks of the right wing of the political landscape began to fill up again with members of the political dynasties which have ruled Japan since almost a century and will continue to do so until today. The influence of the reversal of the purge cannot be understated as it directly shaped the conservative political culture of Japan to this day. The return of ultranationalists to the political establishment came at an ideological cost though. The former state religion was abolished along with the divinity of the emperor, a measure that was not included among the reversals. And although the US government pushed Japan to remilitarize, a return to a militaristic or even colonial empire is out of the question in this new world order. Ultranationalists had to begrudgingly acknowledge that they needed to change their ideology significantly to be able to take part in politics. In order to make their transition to, for the GHQ acceptable conservatism, the ultranationalists refrained from publicly acknowledging the divine nature of the emperor and from engaging in militaristic or racially charged rhetoric and instead focused their efforts on anti-communism and business-friendly capitalism. Along with anti-communism came the necessity to a geopolitical alignment with the United States. In order to shield Japan from communist influence both foreign and domestic, the former adversaries had to turn into allies. Those high-ranking officials who sought to return to politics during the reverse course probably did not have a change of heart about the virtues of democracy and regret their actions as part of an autocratic regime and a defensive war of conquest. However, they had no choice but to dial down their nationalist and militaristic thoughts to a level acceptable to their occupiers. Otherwise, they could not hope to exist in the new political system. The significance of the reverse course is most evident when looking at one man, Nobusuke Kishi. Kishi functioned as a leading civil servant in the Ministry of Commerce of the client state of Manchukuo before the outbreak of the Pacific War. Kishi was instrumental in enslaving millions of Chinese 
to function as free labor in order to turn Manchukuo into an industrial powerhouse that could support Japan's war effort. Many of the enslaved workers died in coal mines or steel factories under catastrophic working conditions. At the time, Kishi was said to have viewed the Chinese population as racially inferior to the pure Japanese. Kishi's economic politics at the time were based on a statist philosophy of incorporating private business ownership into a state-governed economy. To that end, he encouraged private investment into Manchuria, but ultimately retained control over vast sums of funds with little to no oversight from Tokyo. During his time in Manchuria, Kishi became the protege of General Hideki Tojo, who would later be designated the chief Class A war criminal and be executed by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. Kishi returned to Japan in 1939 to become Vice Minister of Commerce. His statist economic policies led to an ideological clash with the Zaibatsu leaders, who branded him a communist, which ultimately led to him being forced out of office just one year later. In 1941, however, he managed a comeback under his mentor, Hideki Tojo, who became Prime Minister. While he served in Tojo's cabinet, he became increasingly disillusioned with the war situation. And in 1944, when Tojo came under scrutiny for the hopeless state of the Japanese Navy in the Pacific, Kishi contributed to his downfall by refusing to resign his position so Tojo can reshuffle the cabinet to keep his head afloat. When the war was over, Kishi, who co-signed the declaration of war against the US, was along with most members of Tojo's cabinet, placed under arrest as a suspected Class A war criminal. Unlike most of his peers, Kishi was released without charge in 1948 on recommendation of prominent US figures who saw in Kishi an excellent pro-US leadership candidate. In 1952, when the occupation of Japan formally ended with the San Francisco Peace Treaty, Kishi could officially return to politics. After an unsuccessful bid creating his own party, he joined the Liberal Party under the longtime pro-US, moderately conservative Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida and won a diet seat. Kishi had deeply rooted ideological differences with his party leader. Kishi was adamant about revising Article 9 and making Japan a normal country which can hold its own on an international stage without sticking to the United States. This rift led to Kishi being banned from the Liberal Party. Kishi, however, defected alongside Ichiro Hatoyama to form the Democratic Party, another conservative party in 1954. One year later, in the 1955 general election, the Democratic Party won and Shigeru Yoshida stepped down as the leader of the Liberal Party. Kishi then construed, along with other prominent politicians, a merger of the two conservative parties to a new Liberal Democratic Party, which exists to this day. The LDP was a giant political party, and in the next general election in 1958, she won 60% of diet seats, and dominated the Japanese government ever since, save a few years. Kishi finally became prime minister one year earlier in 1957 and was now able to execute some of his political ideas. The new prime minister was ideologically different from the more moderate ones in the years just after the war. While Kishi was by no means anti-American, he had some grudges regarding the security treaty between the United States and Japan, which was an unequal treaty giving far-reaching power to US military forces stationed in Japan. Kishi's main policy goal was to revise the treaty, giving Japan more autonomy over its foreign and defense policy, but at the same time still maintaining a close military alliance with a mutual aid agreement between both nations. This, however, would just be the beginning, as Kishi also maintained his position on revising Article 9 
and rebuilding Japan's armed forces in order to aid in the global fight against communism. Fortunately, or unfortunately depending on your opinion, the revision of the security treaty would be realized, along with enormous protests by left-leaning students, socialists and communists. The political front escalated into a full-blown scandal when Kishi had the police arrest and drag out opposition diet members who, even though being in the minority, stalled the voting on the bill. The so-called Anpo protests were the biggest in Japanese history and would ultimately force Kishi to resign and never return to the prime minister's office. The 1955 system, in which the Liberal Democratic Party holds most seats in the parliament, has persisted to this day, with the LDP only losing control in 1993 and 2009 to 2012. The fact that the relatively recent Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who is Kishi's grandson by the way, utters much of the same rhetoric Kishi used in regard to Article 9, shows the effect of the reverse purge, which enabled ultra-nationalists to put themselves under the guise of conservatives and rejoin post-war politics. The reverse purge also led to the unwillingness of the Japanese government to reconcile with former enemies in Asia. The narrative of the war in China and in the Pacific being essentially defensive wars was enabled in society and academics because it was cemented as a core belief of the conservative base of Japanese politics by the very ultra-nationalists who were reverse purged. It is certainly interesting to imagine what would have happened to Japan as a country if the purge were never reversed. Maybe more moderate conservatism would have prevailed under Shigeru Yoshida, and Japanese society would be much more open and sincere about the past. It remains to be seen if the Japanese political landscape can escape the 1955 system after almost 70 years, and what changes this would bring to key issues both foreign and domestic. As of now, the system does not show any signs of breaking up, with the LDP reaching 55% of all diet seats in the recent 2021 general election. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're interested in Japanese politics and history, feel free to subscribe. If you're interested in Nobusuke Kishi's grandson, Shinzo Abe, who is the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history, you can click here. Have a nice day!